Thanks for staying with us. It's time now to go to the press and see what the headlines are this morning on some of our national dailies. And to talk with us this morning is Mr. Chris Kainde Wandu, chartered arbitrator in the UK. He'll be talking with us, uh, uh, reviewing the papers with us this morning. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. It's nice to be here with you this morning. Okay. Uh, well, we'd like to take this time, Chris, before we go to the papers, to say a little bit of thank you to you for all the times that we have called you and you answered our call. We've called without warning and you answered our call. We've disturbed you and disrupted your sleep while abroad so many times and you were always there for being a friend beyond the screen for your amiable person because it is not just being someone who comes on the program and talks to us. You have proven to be a wonderful friend. And so at this time, uh, because a few days ago you've celebrated your birthday, we want to belatedly wish you a happy birthday. This is still August, so it's still your month until we finish this August. So we'd like to pray that God guides you, God protects you, God provides for you in everything that you're doing. Happy birthday in Arias, Chris. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much um, to all the management of um, this wonderful TV station. I, I so much appreciate it. Thank you very much mm. for the accolades. Yeah. Okay, having removed the official part of it from it, we are now going to hold your throat for our cake, which did not get to us, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Don't okay. worry. Your cake will get across to me okay. sooner or later. It, it's not a national <laughs> cake. It's just Chris's cake that will get to us. All right. <laughs> So let's go to the papers now. Um, the first thing is federal government to shut air and fuel stations as petrol hits 1,000 naira per litre. Let's hear you talk on that. That is on point. Uh, the issue, yeah. yes, the issue of waste scarcity is becoming a big problem. Uh, it has never lasted this long. Um, and um, it seems that there's no solution in sight. Uh, and uh, the NMPC on itself, NMPC as it is, Presently, seems not to know what uh, to do, um, but um, and they continue to tell us that um, oh that they have enough reserve. Uh, it was some logistic problem. Initially, they gave the impression that it was due to the end governance, uh, bad um, bad, bad go uh, governance protest. That was what caused the logistics. Then from there, now we don't know. We don't even know what to believe. NNPCL is not even speaking. And knowing fully well that NNPC uh, practically was not less than about ninety percent of the fuel consumption in Nigeria, so everything less fairly on the table of the agency, and that is what we're talking about the efficiency on the part of that agency. Despite all the telling Nigerians they've been doing um, and uh, how patriotic uh, some of the officials uh, are, but that is what we have, and that is what is happening. If you go out everywhere, especially in Lagos, um, you see the long queue of fuel. People now spend hours on, on, um, to queue for fuel. If it could be this bad in Lagos, then you can imagine what situation in other parts of the country is start. Uh, because most of this fuel comes through the, uh, the Lagos port. So, of course, ordinarily you expect that being the first, if first point of call, you have enough fuel in Lagos. Yes, that is what it is. So NMPC need to come out to tell us clearly what is happening and why Nigerians are not happy. And doing that, we see that, uh, as the paper rightly states, um, a liter of fuel is written up to about 1,000 naira per liter. There's another angle to it. Most people, Nigeria, some Nigerians believe that it is also an, a, a, another way of trying to probably increase the price of fuel. Because we've seen what has happened in the past. When NFPC want to increase the price of uh, petroleum products, they try to make it lose cars. When you start buying at 1,000, 1,000 uh, per liter, um, you now get the announcement that, oh, it has increased to 800, uh, 800 naira per liter. Then you ask yourself, then I just always be that, ah, if you be buying for 1,000, what is 1,000, 1,000 to what is uh, 800, and they are just to read. But the fundamental flaw here, as we've said, is that until we get our refineries working, and uh, we start refining most of these products. And uh, this is what we're going to face. NNPCL, uh, since last year, have postponed the, uh, uh, the resumption of production of petroleum products at 
water core refinery about six times. Six times the promised Nigerians I go to, uh, that refinery will start working. If not, actually, the next one, they say September, let's wait and see. But if um, um, water court is working, I'm worried. And the second, you know, there are two, um, two refineries in water court. If the two are not working, the one in water is not working, Kabna is not working, then you can be rest assured that we we'll continue to this problem. Then go to petroleum that's supposed to be an alternative, uh, one of the largest petroleum uh, petrol, uh, refinery in the world. We're still being frustrated from taking up, although we've been told now that petroleum products we start coming out from say, November or October, I can't even remember that one. But if they also cannot get the necessary crude to be able to refine petroleum products and other related products, then we still find ourselves where we are. But it's just unfortunate that um, it's, um, Nigeria uh, has turned to a large elephant with clay feet. And the little resources that God has given us to be able to take care of our lives, where our leaders are mismanaging. And you ask yourself, is it the same oil that Saudi Arabia has that has become a wonder of the world? Or most of these other countries uh, in the world that turn our countries around for their countries? But this is our own, it is a cause. And it's quite unfortunate. Not because of our own personal effort, but because of the mismanagement of our leaders on the resources that God has given us. But that is where we find ourselves. Okay. Um, let's move quickly to the Daily Trust newspaper. The headline, uh, the leading headline here is saying 21. By the way, Dangote still promised us that in September there will be fuel uh, in, from his refinery. We'll hope that uh, it will come to pass. Uh, 21 states seek 1.65 trillion naira loans despite 40% rise in uh, FAC uh, revenues. Uh, but we have, okay, the writers here are saying. Uh, 7.6 trillion naira released to states, local governments in one year. 20% of June allocation enough to build 320 PHCs, and experts urge accountability. So we are here now looking at states seeking loans to the tune of 1.65 trillion naira, uh, according to the uh, report. Uh, despite 40% rise in fact revenues. But we heard also, on the other hand, that uh, the, the last FAC meeting, the states did not get sufficient funds, not sufficient, they did not get as much funds as they were supposed to get because the federal government uh, took out some funds to keep for the implementation of the 70% or 70,000 Naira minimum wage. So I, I don't know what your opinion is on this. They're seeking loans to this tune in this country and then the federal government on the other hand is reducing their allocation because of the 70,000 naira minimum wage well so this thousand minimum wage when the federation uh, it's a, it is a federation uh, the federal government i don't know when they, I, i've not I, i've not read that story on the issue of reporting uh, 70,000 naira i don't know what is that for the federal government has no right to withdraw uh, to be told a monument for states. Every state and local government um, will be able to get this money. Uh, that is what is stipulated uh, in the Constitution of Nigeria. Except there are some loans uh, that we are taken by the states, uh, of which uh, either from federal government or certain allocation that we are giving, the pressure allocation that was given to the state that have not been repaid by the state, then that can be deducted from source, but that the federal government will withdraw 70,000 Naira um, uh, uh, minimum wage from the account of state government. That is unheard of. And as I said, I don't know the source of that story. I've not read it, so I wouldn't talk much about it. But the one that concerns me is the issue of um, the states um, getting going for more loans despite the fact that they've gotten about 40% increase in allocation since last year, since the removal of uh, petroleum sources. And the question you ask yourself, what are the states doing with those money? State government doing with those money? What are the governors doing with those money? Because when you look at the various states, you don't see any level of uh, infrastructure on ground to be able to uh, show for the added advantage they're getting from further allocation of um, uh, of uh, more uh, more allocation from the federal, uh, but then also some of them also also increased their IGR. I know of some states that have increased their IGR by close to about 30, 40, or even 50 percent 
uh, in the last one year. They also ask yourself, what are they? So those are the fundamentals. And that is where I think um, um, uh, CSOs, NGOs, and even the media come to people because we have not been able to scrutinize um, allocations given to these states and see and ask questions. Or to start asking questions uh, from the governors and our leaders, even at the local government, uh, yeah, to show us evidence of what they've done with all the money they're collecting. Then we are not practicing a, a democracy. A situation where um, governors go every, every month cap in hand to Abuja, collect money, and probably just stuff it in their bank account or convert them to dollars and siphon them is not the reason. And that is where the um, graph agencies also um, you continue to ask yourself what is the work of ICPC, what is the work of EFCC? Because these are areas that they should be channeling their effort. Because this is not the money made for any government. It's not made for any government. It is the money of Nigerians, and Nigerians should be able to hold their leaders accountable. But when we sit down and feel that nothing is happening and pretend that nothing is happening, oh, it is a uh, legend, whatever, then that is what happened. But it's, I, I, I still continue to ask myself, why do they continue to collect these loans? And most of them are not. These loans that are collected are not repaid by them. They leave these loans for um, other um, administration that will come after them. That is why you see that most of the states are so sad with them that most of the governments don't even know what to do to do at all. At the end of it all, you see that what the state from a high level of it is being used for service of respect for me or to continue to have um hold our leaders accountable at the state level, at the local government, even at the federal level. As a, just as we're talking about is, um, state and local government, that is simply goes to the federal government. Every day you see uh, in the government of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu collecting one billion dollars loan, five hundred million dollars loan, um, and you ask yourself what is there to show for this sum of these loans? And as I repeated earlier on, these loans at times have a repayment period of about 20, 30 years, which will not be repaid by this. Why collecting those? I don't have any problem with collecting collection of loans. Countries of the world collect. But you see that what they do on their own, with their own, is that they have to use it, they invest it in critical infrastructure, they invest it in areas that will benefit the lives of their citizens. But ours here is what they do is collect loot and go back and collect and collect. And it becomes a, a, a huge problem. So we have to start scrutinizing this money that has been collected by our, our leaders on our behalf. And what they use it for. Except we do that, then that's the huge problem as well as our science. Okay, but there's a small headline there, the same uh, newspaper, saying GDP grows by 3.19% in the second quarter of 2024. Uh, some people might see this and say it's good news, it's a good point scored by this uh, administration, 3.19% uh, in the second quarter. Uh, what do you think? How significant is that to our economy and to our livelihood? Uh, how has that improved the life of Nigeria? How has that affected the price of rice, please, Gary, um, uh, tomatoes, okra, and other food items? Then, until I see that reflecting uh, the price of food and services, then it, it, it doesn't make any much of it because most of them are not a very good advantage. Um, data and figures that are very, very relevant and are not true. Yes, it means by 3%. The fact is that, on to tell me that the price of yam has reduced from 6,000, 5,000 to 2,000 naira. Then, that is what the average Nigeria wants to know. How much is the bag of rice? It has gone down from 8,000 to 60,000, or even to 40,000, or 30,000 for what it used to be. All of them good. Gary, one more go, Gary. How much is it now? That is, that is what an average Nigerian wants to do. But all these figures mean that uh, the, GDP has been, the GDP has increased by 5%, 2%, and uh, we want me to start clapping. I won't. It is, uh, for me, until the uh, average Nigerian feel the point. Most Nigerians go to bed very hungry now. Not even, when we say average Nigerian, we're not even talking about even those that are working. Those that are working, the 70,000 uh, Naira. The money that was probably but by, by the federal government or the government at best I pay seventy thousand I cannot even buy a bag of bread uh, of rice as as it were. And Nigerians on the day basis are crying. Most Nigerians are going to pay on now school is resuming. 
Most parents are already crying because they don't know where they're going to get money to send their children back to school because eating is not is even not. We are talking of eating, I'm not even talking of other necessities like clothing and like housing. People have to pay rent. So that is for me that the major under, until the government continues to start addressing this issue as clearly as it were. Which brings me to the, the, the story on the bottom uh, bottom of um, of, um, uh, of that daily trust that I saw it. But Bassanjo, maybe you should just pull it up. Let's yes. That story. Use angry. Yes. There'll be trouble if we don't act. That's according Good. to Bassanjo. I think the, the producer should pull up that story. Mm. Very very apt. That story is very very apt. It's even more important to me than um, the the head the, 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 the I think it's daily trust or guardian. I can't remember which one. But the um, president. Uh, Former President Ulysses of Passenger says that we are toying, we are we are toying with a time bomb, which will rather we explode, and the government will not be able to handle it. We saw what happened in the end by government uh, protest, and especially in the north, what happened? We are children of uh, children. We are trooping out in their numbers, protesting. Although some of them were a bit destructive at it, but the challenge for me now is that. The government have not learned anything. If it's, instead of address the issue, what they have done now is to call the protesters, all the protesters, as looters, which is not true. All the, they are not looters. All of them are not looters. They are just few people uh, that took advantage of the situation. But the fundamental issue behind that protest is what we are trying to raise. Oh, we have arrested over 1,000 people uh, for looting. They have gone to court to secure, and I don't even know where in the world that is not secure. Uh, a court injunction where uh, or court order where they have to be reminded for the next 60 days or how many days or six months or I can't remember what I'm mean now. We are only diluting the, the issue as it were. That will not solve the problem. The basic issue is that these people came out to cry out over the terrible um, hunger that is in the land. There is this over idea that is going on that is the Abraham power. You know the meaning of Abraham power in my Hebrew language. We are hungry. Nigerians are hungry and they are asking for food. Provide those basic necessities. That is the essence of governance. That is the essence of government. But now we are brushing the road with one straight brush and say, oh, those are protesters, we are looters. And no, I don't, I don't agree with that. Those that protesters have a genuine reason for protesting. That does not necessarily also mean that those that came out to be looting should not be prosecuted. I'm totally for that. Because it was supposed to be a simple um, um, protest where Nigeria will ventilate the idea. But we've come to see that the government has straight aside that and now focus more on the issue that those that protested were protesting. And that is why I find that story and that statement credited to former President Ulysses Gonbasan warning that something has to be done. And if not something if something is not done, then we are sitting on a long, long thing. The unfortunate thing is that um, no matter what kind of criticism you give, no matter how constructive it is, uh, it always boils back to the fact that it's either they will tell you that you're in opposition or, like in the case of uh, the former president, they tell him, uh, you are one of those who brought us to this uh, situation that we are in right now. And I don't know the place of repentance, the place of retrospect, the place of rethinking what you have done and trying to give advice. I'm sure that's what every parent does. Um, they try to make sure that children don't fall into the same mistakes that they make. And that's all the advice they give to their children without necessarily pinpointing what they did in their time. But they just know that the outcome is going to be bad. I wish that we'll get to that point where we can always yeah, get... Let, take, let me quickly intervene on that. You know, most of our leaders think that they are more Nigerian than us. And that is always the problem. They are, thinking they are more patriotic than those of us that are on the other side, which is not true. The uh, Maguire administration used eight years to blame um, PDP. You remember vividly. Mm. Anything that happened, they oh, the PDP destroyed the country for 16 years. PDP, it has spent, it spent eight years. Tell me what Buhari and APC achieved. This, the, this APC government has been in government for have been in government for about nine years now. Tell me, are they, are they still, will they still continue to blame PDP? Ask them what they have done in the past. So that is how it goes. So I totally agree with you. Um, trying to lay blames. Government is a continuum for goodness sake. And I've said the time and time on this program that when you pick up a company, when you take over a company, you take up both assets and liabilities. You don't need the liabilities as talking about assets. No. 
is where the access are liability. So Nigeria don't want any excuses. Go and get the job done. And if you don't get the job done, then you get fired. That is how you that is how it works in other countries. Okay. Well, maybe this hiring and firing, maybe in the case of security, might help. Tinubu replaces DSS, NIA, DGs. Do you think it will be? Because any time the new people come into power, they, the zeal, the spirit that comes with them is so much that they will promise heaven and earth. I, I remember someone who is about to retire right now, or I don't know if he has retired already, said when he came into office that he feels like a lion. I don't know if he's going now like a cat or still that lion, but whatever, whatever he uh, promised us, I'm not sure we saw. Or like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the, well, let's hope that the new um, security uh, heads uh, will be able to make some changes. Uh, well, this is more like a, a place to, um, from what the president, when he came, he appointed new service chiefs. He appointed the new NSA and the uh, other security chiefs. Um, he has not, uh, is the NIA and DSS that uh, he appointed the uh, uh, IG of police. So the only area where he has not really touched is NIA and, um, and the DSS. The two were appointed by former President uh, Muhammad Buhari. So I think the president just said that now he needed his own men that he can talk to and that can get the job done. I hope that they're able to get the job done and as quickly as possible when we look at the level of insecurity in Nigeria as it's true. Um, so I have any problem. I don't have any problem with that. Um, they'll be faced with new challenges that let them squarely the best. That's also the issue is also let them sit on the mandate and focus on what has been issue. See what have happened in the last few few weeks, especially with the part of um, DSS, where they are just going around arrest. Me, I'm, I'm much more interested in journalists. Where journalists are just being picked up and arrested uh, unduly for whatever slimsy uh, excuses. We just saw what happened just on Sunday or thereabouts. We are a former editor with um, BBC, he was just picked up after arriving in Nigeria. And I just think that's a deliberate attempt by th this government to its uh, security agencies to silence not opposition, but even um, journalists. Especially those that are, yes, the journalists, those that are going into uh, investigative journalism. If you say somebody wrote something, that, why don't you present the facts? That is, that is what it is. Somebody has investigated certain stories or issues and put on the public media. If you say that it's the job, then put up the facts as well. You cannot continue Muslim journalists from doing their job. It can never work. Even though the military regime, it has never worked. So I hope the new headsman uh, at the DSS will be able to have a rating and see for more strategic uh, ways of management. Look at what happened in, um, in Abuja a few days ago. We had the Shiites came in and I had a, a few days in Abuja and several police were killed and also and I asked where was the point of intelligence. Uh, on this matter. So the NIA is more like our own CIA like in the, or in the uh, US. Then the DSS is what we call the secret police uh, uh, in Nigeria. So I, I wish the new uh, headman best of luck in their new assignment. I saw some video moving, even making the rounds, uh, social media where there are jubilant DSS uh, staff who are happy with the relief of um, uh, former DG Pichi from his post of position. I would just say, let them calm down. Uh, you don't know the person that is coming, whether it be better or worse than the one you had. So, but I wish them the best. The particular story that I have not seen on the, some of the pieces we, uh, we just looked at, probably as we are rounding up, is on the issue of the statement credited to the uh, Minister of Education on age limit. I think we should be able to put that up. Um, one of the newspapers, I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 one of, it's one of our hot topics for today. All the newspapers are carrying it that uh, yeah. you have to be 18 I years before. I want to on that, just even for one minute. Even for one minute. Um, the fact is that we always get our priority in Nigeria. Look at uh, the minister who is from the north. I thought that his lower priority is to be able to find a way of taking these millions and millions of children out of school in the north. If you understand what I mean, there are so many children as well. Those are majority. I thought that by now we should be able to come out with a policy that could be able to address that issue. It's not easy. It's not. What is more interested is trying to cut in the age of people that students are there. When countries are opening up their channels, so many instances where in the world you see young children do wonderful things. But these ones are just interested in dragging us back, taking us back to the year 1900. When you say that oh, a student cannot, they cannot write for yet until they are 18 and the rest of them, and you ask yourself, where is this one coming from? Where is this man coming from? And this is supposed to be a former vice chancellor of a private university. 
and the world has gone beyond what it's doing. It should be more interested in making sure that the schools are working and making sure that the teachers are getting the right um, salary. As it is is about to go in on strike now, I thought that by now that issue had sorted the rest of them. This man should go and sit down and find better things to do than just try to push politics that are so archaic and taking us 1,000 years back. That is my own personal opinion. Since you see we are discussing, I'm looking forward to your discussion this morning. Yeah, 18 years. I was asking those questions as well, and uh, I didn't quite understand what they were talking about because uh, they are concentrating on tertiary education, they are concentrating on WAEC, they are concentrating on all other things, but <laughs> leaving the basics. So I was asking the question, what if you are, have the opportunity to go to school and you are 16, and then you are not supposed to write WAEC? What happens in the next two years that you are going to be yes. waiting for 18? What happens to yeah. people, parents who want to raise their children to maybe six years before they begin primary school so that they can get to 18 when they are writing WAEC? or when they should write WAEC. So what, will, what provisions are made for these people to have a conducive working environment where they can, they can, they can raise these their children? Because every day you have to hustle, you have to, to break your, bo your bones to make ends meet for yourself. Uh, I don't yes. know. It's... Yeah, I totally, yeah I, to I totally agree with you. Let me just even stand up so that's, I'm, I'm trying to be modest. My daughter got admission into the university before she was 16, and she got into the university. We believe that when she was graduating, she got a, she made a first class in computer science. I'm not talking about computer science. She has gone for that to, for her master's degree in one of the foreign countries, and she also made a first class in computer science in her master's degree. So tell me, if you have if you have studied that that child who got admission because of her level of age at 16 and have gone ahead to make a first class in her um, field and have gone ahead. To, uh, to read her master's in a foreign land and also made a postcard in her, her master's. So if you have waited as a bitch child wait to wait when she's 18, then what is going to what would have happened? So I think that's why I'm saying that this policy and this minister needs next to nothing about what he's doing. I think it should be more focused on the problem, fundamental problem facing the, the country, especially the education sector. Rather than go, that is how the jump um, register tried to come up with such other ideas, and it was shut down within two hours. He reversed himself. I hope that this movie will not take us back to where we are coming from. This is so terrible a, a policy that I, I, I think should this time. Um, this man, this minister, definitely doesn't know what he's doing. And if he doesn't know, maybe we can just move him to Minister of Men Affairs, create one ministry for him. Since the government is not creating. To the Minister of Men Affairs and just put in there. Okay, Minister of Men Affairs, Chris. That's yes. a new one. I don't think I'll be the Minister of Men Affairs. I don't think I'll be the Minister of Okay, Chris, thank you so much for your time this morning. Once again, uh, belated happy birthday to you, and we hope that God smiles on you and gives you more fortune to continue to be the friend that you've always been to us. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that just, uh, very, very, Thank you very much to the You're management uh, and staff of Plus TV. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful week ahead. You too. We'll be talking to Chris Kainde Wandu, a chartered arbitrator in the UK and a friend of uh, Plus TV, I, I would like to put it. And he celebrated his birthday last week, so we're just felicitating with him uh, this morning. We'll take a break now. When we return, we'll take our first hot topic. Do stay with us.